Hello, Jim Howard here. Welcome to Howard's Notebook. I've been online since uh, 1982, so uh, enjoy the video that's uh, coming up. Hello, uh, Jim Howard here in Fort Worth, Texas. Today's date, it is April 10th of 2019, and this is going to be a... A story video and it's going to be I think I don't I should I don't uh, I don't make notes usually the only notes I really have is up I went ahead and uh, up on the browser which by the way that browser is uh, the new Windows uh, micro soft edge develop developer so it's the one that's using the chrome whatever it is part of it you know that's it's a chromium chromium and it's a you know it's beta uh, my previous video i think if you go look at that you can click and uh, go and, you know, download it. It's not complete, you know, but it, it's working. And that's what I'm using here right now. Uh, this is going to be a story video. So I'm, what I try to do, but I get sidetracked. I'm going to try to keep it to a very narrow little time frame or a little various or a little... Uh, area and hope that I don't uh, end up talking about space travel or World War One or two or something you know I'm gonna try to keep it narrowed down to uh, the time frame when I got my first computer if you uh, go to museums uh, like out in California, they have a, that's, I, I'm going to, I, that's, I actually went there, so, um, I'll get to that. I, I'm starting to ramble again. Uh, I was always interested in electronics and high-tech stuff before there was high-tech stuff. And, uh, there was and I used to read Popular Electronics and other uh, White's radio log and just ever you know, and listen to shortwave radio and whatever. And there was a Popular Electronics issue. And if you go to some place, to a lot of different museums or probably if you went into Microsoft headquarters or whatever, there would be the cover of, uh, probably framed in gold or something, you know, the cover of Popular Electronics. They had an issue that came out to build your own personal computer. Oh, my God. And I remember reading that, and, of course, it was, you know, and I, I was building kits, uh, tube tester, signal generator, uh, all types of, Heath Kits, mainly. And that was a nice company. They made quality products. I'm starting to ramble again. They made quality products, and the wires came pre-cut, and you had everything you needed. It had a great instruction thing, and you you, built, you could build things. But uh, <clears throat> this issue of Popular Electronics, it was like, you know, uh, you, had to, you, would, you had to follow the circuit diagram, you would have had to cut your wires. You would have had to wind your coils. You would have had to do, and I just knew there was no way that I could do that. But I wanted a personal computer. And uh, one, uh, this is this is what mine looked like. Um, the Radio Shack Model 1 that I bought. 
in, I think, 1978, I believe, except it, it came with a tape recorder. <laughs> so you, you loaded your program in from a tape recorder. If you had data, you saved it out to the tape recorder. Now, this was the radio, you know, and this, if this looks like a TV set, that's, you know, it was like a Radio Shack TV set that Radio Shack had, you know. And uh, down here was their interface, which cost $350. And the interface lets you add more memory. Because it came, the Radio Shack Model 1 came with 4K of memory. I know I'm old. I, I'm not making a mistake. I'm not meaning to say 4 megs or 4 gig, no, 4K of memory. And um, you you could upgrade it, I think, to, it's, well, when it first came, they didn't have the, you know, you had to wait a while. Um, then... I think you could upgrade it to 16K, and then you needed the, I believe, you needed the, interva the interface box. And it was $350, and the interface box lets you upgrade to 48K of memory, and it lets you plug in a floppy drive. Uh, not a hard disk, but a floppy drive that I think it, the floppy drive that was the that's a big one you may have seen some you may have some laying around your if you're an old person held 360k and then actually radio shack came out eventually with a tandy 1000 i bought two of those and the floppy drive on it held 780 i think it was or 60k of memory on the floppy but the Tandy 1000 came with a 10 meg hard drive. My God, a 10 meg hard drive. Oh, I was in heaven. But back to this computer. I, I purchased another device that let me upgrade to 48K of memory, and I don't think it did anything else. Uh, I didn't have any other functions that I could use. Uh... A company eventually came out with an Ektron stringy floppy device about the size of a little metal thing about the size of a business card and it used tapes that were on a loop and I purchased four of those and that replaced the uh, tape recorder which was a Radio Shack just a regular Radio Shack tape recorder that uh, they were using and the Ektron stringy floppy uh, device replaced that and I had four of them and then I could send a command I forget what it was you know like CMD1 and then that would send data to the first Ektron stringy unit and I could CMD2 and whatever and then you could also like you know read data in by doing a command CMD you know, R or something like that, one or two or whatever, and that was pretty neat. Uh, but I, I, um, I wish I had my old. I sold it to a uh, guy I worked with. I don't think he ever used it. I think he just put it on his shelf. <clears throat> I would like to. Uh, well, I don't have any, I don't have much, you know, I would like to, uh, if I had more room, I'd like to have one underneath the glass just sitting over there. Um, now, a Commodore Pet, I saw this around that time in a library, and they were, there was like four of them in a library. And I, uh, I don't remember this tape recorder being there, though. So it may have been a little bit different. Let's see if we have different pictures here. Yeah, I remember the keyboard being something like this. What in the hell, you know, are these? 
So I tried playing with it there in the in the public library, but I couldn't uh, I couldn't do anything, you know, couldn't do anything with it. Um, so the Radio Shack Model One. <clears throat> Oh, there you actually see their box right here. That's not the one I had, of course. Um, that's also not the set TV set. That's not the monitor, so they must have come up with a different <coughs> a little bit. This must be like a little later uh, upgrade or uh, something. Says release date was August 3rd of 1977. <clears throat> so I got mine almost right away. So I must have got it in maybe 1978, but I'm thinking I got it in 1977. Um, I'll put links to these. Uh, Okay, here is, yeah, here is what the uh, monitor looked like. You know, I don't think that is the exact, it looks like it, but I think there again, I think I've, uh, and the keyboard did not have, have this, so there again, it must have been, a, it's a, must have been a little later version of it. I never looked inside it. Radio Shack had a policy, sort of like Apple. If you um, if you did anything to it, the you know, guarantee was null, you know, don't bring it to them to uh, to be fixed or whatever. Never actually had any uh, never had any problem with it. This looks like a Okay, Model 3. I never actually had a Model 3. I never had a Model 4. I never heard of the 4P. I have no idea what this is. I had a Model 100, which was like a laptop for, you know. I think I've already started digressing right before I got the Radio Shack Model 1 computer I had a Texas Instrument calculator TI-58 and this is it here and it was programmable so before I had my first computer now I'm not sure this is a TI-58C I'm not sure if I had a TI-50 you know a, a or it was expensive. I'm thinking like three hundred dollars or something, but it was programmable, and I even wrote a little few, you know, a little, I mean, a very simple, you know, like generate a random number, and then I had to guess the random number, and it would tell me right or wrong, and you know, whatever. Um, oh God, this is. A printer for it that printed on thermal paper that was like that wide and uh, I purchased it and it cost more than the um, cost more than the TI 58 calculator I never looked inside it either but um, When I, at some point, well, I was subscribed to all of the, when I got my Radio Shack Model 1 computer, uh, I was subscribed to all, you know, all the computer magazines, and I'd buy them, and maybe I wasn't subscribed to them all, but I'd buy them on the newsstand, and uh, look at, you know, read them, and then they started having advertisements for something called a modem. 
And I honestly did not have much of an idea what a modem did or what you could do with it. But in the classified section or whatever, I ordered in a, a modem that came in and it was hooked into your parallel printer port, which was an RS-232 port. And uh, the modem that I got was in the wiring or the settings or whatever was using RS-233 or something like that for some reason. RS-232, if I remember correctly, maybe I got the numbers mixed up, was like standard, as much as you could have a standard. And uh, so I got it in, and I plugged it into my computer, and found that in the Kansas City, Missouri area, there were a lot of people that back in those days come to be, came to think that I was the first one to have a computer bulletin board system in Kansas City. I was not. There was Form 80 headquarters, a, I was lucky because in Kansas City, Missouri area, he wasn't, and actually I wasn't in Can. yeah, maybe at then I was, I was, maybe I was in Belton, can't remember. Um, but he had a Radio Shack Model 1 computer, and he wrote software for it and sold the software. And there were uh, bullet people with computers around the world that were using his Form 80 software. I think I have. So I was kind of lucky that the headquarters system was right there. So there was Form 80 headquarters. Uh, there was an Apple users group. And there was, or was it a Commodore users group? I can't remember, and I think it was an Apple. Maybe it was Commodore users group. And there was a guy who had a commodities bulletin board system that he had set up that I guess he must have probably worked at the commodities exchange in Kansas City, Missouri, and the only reason I dialed into it was because I had a modem, and <laughs> and that was it. Let's see, yeah. So anyway, I would call in. Now, of course, now, if you wanted to call other bulletin board systems, at that point you had to call out of town, and the phone company, uh, they were like bandits. They should have wore, you know, they were uh, you were forbidden, you know, to have a, you couldn't hook your own extension up, the phone company, you couldn't, uh, they just didn't allow you to do anything. And all long distance phone calls cost a fortune. And calls within the state were uh, even more expensive. By the way, in the background, I'm running this. I don't run it, <laughs> but uh, it, I'm running BB it from, and it's, I'll put the link to it. it. It's five or six parts or something. BBS the documentary, and uh, by Jason Scott, he actually came to, to three DVD set. He actually came to, at the time, Carrollton, Texas, not just to interview me, but to interview several other people in the area. He traveled around the United States. I think he even maybe went into Canada to interview people who had computer bulletin board systems. And uh, I'm going to try to set like this so you can kind of see that in the back, add a little bit of... Uh, or maybe I should expand a little bit. Anyway, Jason um, put out this great um, documentary. 
and they're all sold out. I don't know if you could find one to buy or not, but he put it, I, maybe I'm using the wrong term, maybe he didn't put it in the public domain, but he has inf informed everybody that you're free to uh, make a copy of it, you're free to give copies to friends, you're, um, you can, you know, so I guess I'll probably have to put a, some type of a uh, notice here or else, well, maybe I'll just let YouTube flag it, flag my uh, thing or something, or I'll just maybe turn off monet monetization on it anyway, or I don't know, pain in the ass. Um, anyway, there was the, so I bought a modem, and then I could call in to the three bulletin board systems that were in Kansas City. And, uh, oh, I was going to say, Jason Scott came uh, a few years ago to Carrollton, well, before he put out, because he was making this. I think, okay, maybe, yeah, I'm not, I don't want to do that right now. I think maybe you're going to see me up in the corner here for a few seconds. I'm in the documentary, and he, re he came and interviewed me for three hours, <laughs> and... Uh, He used me in his documentary maybe three or four times, and the clips are extremely, you know, short. So, but he uh, recorded me for three hours. He released some of the recordings of people that he did uh, back then, right after he put this documentary out. He released... Uh, Oh, six or seven of the videos, and uh, I think they're available on the actual interview. And he contacted me and said, "Hey, Jim, uh, the next video that I release, you know, the three-hour, you know, interview, the next one that I release, uh, I'm going to release yours." And he never released mine, and he never released any more. So I don't know why. I got a feeling, me talking for three hours, uh, no telling what I said. He may have, maybe he, I don't know, I don't think he could stand to watch it for three hours. Uh, but maybe he looked at it and decided, oh, no, I don't think I better release that. But anyway, when he came to interview me, um, he set up his, I have some pictures of that. Because I was, you know, running a bulletin board system uh, or was I on, well, I was streaming video back then. There was no YouTube then or any of the rest of it, but I was streaming video. So I was streaming the video, but no audio as he was, and it, as his camera was set up and he was, you know, doing me. So anyway, he said, okay, you know, and started recording. So I started talking. And uh, then at some point I said, uh, uh, Jason, maybe you'd like to ask me some questions. And he laughed and he said, well, that's never happened before. And I said, uh, what's never happened before? And he said, I have never, you know, started re making one of these recordings of, you know, somebody. And uh, he says, you talked for 45 minutes nonstop without me asking a question. I said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And he said, no. He says, that is that is really interesting. He said, that's never happened before. So then it, he asked me some more, you know, then he started asking me some questions. So... um I'll put links to the YouTube videos. These are on YouTube. Seven or eight, I think, or five. I can't remember. And maybe I won't put a link to each one of them. But if I put a link to the first one, then when you watch it, you can click and go and watch the rest of them if you want to. Have to be careful if I, 
you'll miss me. Maybe you already did because I'm only in there three or four times. Um, yeah, I'm actually not. Well, I don't know. I know the camera's there, but I'll talk this way so you get a little added up there. Well, I'm going to uh, exit out of the big screen anyway, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, so I purchased, as I said, this uh, modem, and it was wired for RS. 233 or something instead of RS230 whatever and oh that was it I could not it was an Apple bulletin board system I could not get in that's the other one so it was Form 80 headquarters a guy's commodity BBS which he set up really nice and an Apple BBS and I could not get into that because of bit rate or you know was not so I turned around and purchased, I didn't send the other one back, that's before Amazon. Uh, so I purchased another one that used the standard RS-232, and I got that in, and then I could get into the Apple. There was no reason to go to the Apple thing. The Apple bulletin board system, or maybe later Commodore added one, and I can't remember. I think I have a feeling that later on after I started my bulletin board system and running it. I think Commodore added one. And there there was no point in me going to the Commodore one because it just ran, and it ran for years and years, and I don't think anybody ever, you know, did anything. I'm sure they probably went in and said, hey, the Commodore, you know, meeting is such and such a time or and place or something. They might have done that, but so far as... There were some files that you could download, and uh, by the way, later on, after, you know, Radio Shack, uh, computer, whatever, I had a Commodore 64, I had a bunch of them, you know, I had one that was running the bulletin board system all the time, I had one that I used to play games, I had one that, uh, one of the, there is the, uh, no, that's the Apple too. I was going to say, one of the people on here said something uh, that I've quoted a few times. I should give him credit, I guess, a little footnote or something. And that's that, uh, and he, anyway, he says it in this video that he, because he was using a, uh, running a Commodore bulletin board system. And he said you could put the Commodore 64 in the closet if you had a problem with it, and then it would repair itself. <laughs> They really were dependable, and uh, I ran for years on a Commodore 64, a bulletin board system. Um, there was before the Commodore 64. There was the uh, the what was it? Can't remember now the smaller version of it and I actually ran the uh, a B the BBS on it for a few hours one day just to show that I could do it the only problem was it had very little memory and when it would answer the phone it would say Howard's notebook and enter your username and so then you would type in your username and then it would start searching but it didn't have enough memory it had to move some stuff so it would be like of course everybody would hang up it'd be like well 10 minutes later then it would pop up and say enter your password so of course i just wanted to see if i could i just wanted to be able to say i don't know 40 years later that i ran on a uh oh i can't remember anyway so i um By the way, um, just before I started this, um, I downloaded the latest version of Windows. Let's see, view, 
update history. And I downloaded the 2019-04 Cumulative Update for Windows 10 version 1903. And so now, that's if I'm correct, and I believe I am. Uh, this computer is running the final version of this Windows program. Uh, now, there shouldn't be any, though there'll be more, you know, there'll be upgrades, if, if, or not upgrades so much as fixes for problems. Uh, they'll do that. Um, but, I mean, this is it. And they're already working on the next two versions, I believe, of Windows. So this should be the final version of Windows. And like I said, though, they'll be, they'll come up with some type of a correction for something and have to fix something. But this is it. Now their attention can, is turned to the next version of Windows. Um, I forget. What this guy was. I think this is a part of the thing where they're talking about on this video where we talked about how everybody was very competitive with their, you know, if you had a Apple computer or a Texas Instrument or a Commodore or an Atari, whatever computer you had, the you attacked everybody else's, you know. If you had if you had a bulletin board system, these people, you know, of course, all of us in this documentary had, uh, you, a lot of times these people would not allow somebody who had a different type of a computer, you'd be locked out of their system. They wouldn't allow you to, uh, to use their system. It was really a war. I did not buy into that at all. I never bought into that. My uh, bulletin board system was uh, always open to everybody. I didn't do any censorship. I uh, Some of these people, and this may be about the point where they're talking about that, where they talk about <coughs> at Christmas time, of course, in the beginning, there was, you know, it was sort of, we were few in number, you know. But then when it became, or every kid wanted a modem, you know, and they got them at Christmas or whatever, a lot of these bulletin board system people here said that they would take their bulletin board system down right on Christmas morning and leave it down for a few days just so the young people uh, couldn't use their modem to get into their, uh, uh, you know, into their system. I did the exact opposite. Well, I didn't, didn't. I didn't take mine down. I left mine, left mine up, and uh, everybody was welcome. And I tried to help everybody. And years later, uh, years later, I would run into people. Like when the first internet service provider came to the Kansas City, Missouri area, they were, you know, they were the first internet service provider. I actually went to their office. I don't think they expected anybody to show up at their office. I actually showed up at their office, and, I mean, it wasn't like you go in the door, and then there's a secretary. I think there was like two guys there. And, you know, but I went in the little area there, and the guy came out. I said, I'd like to sign up for your service. And he said, okay, and asked me my name or whatever, and I said, uh, you know, Jim Howard. And he said, you know, Jim Howard, you're not Jim Howard of Howard's Notebook. And I said, yes. Oh, and he just, you know, I, when I was a kid, I called into it. You were the first bulletin board system I ever called in. I got online and chat and you helped me and whatever. And then he said, wait a minute. And I forget the guy, you know, like, Joe, Joe, come out here, come out here. And Joe comes out or whatever. This is Jim Howard of Howard's Notebook. Wow, Jim Howard, Howard, when I was a kid, I called, you know. So, and then you're, you know, after that, 
I would run into somebody in business or in computers or something like that, and they'd be, oh, Howard's Notebook. You're Jim Howard of Howard's Notebook. Uh, one time I went into a radio, well, I went into Radio Shack more than one time, but I went in there all the time. Actually, for a short period of time, I was a manager trainee, and then I told him to take this job and shove it. Um, but anyway, one time I went into a Radio Shack store, and Radio Shack, or the Tandy Corporation, you know, let's say they had 3,000 stores, and they're turning out, there, and I don't think they had, uh, you know, I don't think they were having a made in China. And I'm not probably a made in Tandy Corporation headquarters in Fort Worth, Texas. But uh, the store, would, that's when I was a manager trainee uh, at a Radio Shack store in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, uh, Bannister Mall mall store just opened uh, Radio Shack you couldn't you know as the manager of the Radio Shack you couldn't order in a computer because or more you couldn't order two or three you know computers or whatever because if every store just ordered one that'd be like I don't know I don't know how many stores they had then 3,000 5,000 let's say 3,000 That'd be 3,000 computers they had to ship to their store. So what I did is, you know, I had to, I'd order two or three and make up a, a name. You know, John Smith uh, purchased a uh, computer and you need to ship it, you know. So they would ship in two or three. And my goal was to set one up in the store so people could actually see one operating and whatever. But... As soon as I would be unpacking, you know, when two or three came in and I was intending to sell two, set one up at the store, people would come in and say, is that, I'll take it, right? They would buy them. But anyway, later, after I had quit Radio Shack and I went up one day, I think to that same store, yeah, I think it was, I went in, they didn't know me, that turnover had already, you know, they didn't know me in the store, but I... I went in, they had a computer, Radio Shack, you know, Model 1 computer there set up. And the uh, Radio Shack employee was, uh, the Radio Shack employee, let's see, interviewed. Watch for my name. Watch for my name. Come on, where's my name? Uh, come on, I want to be a star. Actually, I am a star. Of the, I didn't tell you about the, uh, there, the bottom, me. That's me, the star of the, uh, I didn't get there yet. I'll probably remind me. I'm going to tell you how I am the, I was only in there for <laughs> probably less than 30 seconds if you added them all together. Anyway, I went into the Radio Shack store. And to pick up something, man, I bought a lot of stuff from Radio Shack. Uh, I went in and the salesman or whatever was talking to a potential customer. And he was saying, you've got to see this. This is fantastic. This guy has a, a computer bulletin board system online called Howard's Notebook. It is just wonderful. <laughs> and he logged in, you know, logged into it. So I was just standing there and I never said any, you know, I never said anything. Made me feel kind of good. Um, so anyway, I got this second modem in, and then I could dial into the Apple users group, which was, a, there was no reason to, uh, go to it, but then there was three or four bulletin board systems. So, of course, I did log into the Form 80 headquarters one, where the guy wrote software for their, uh, Radio Shack Model 1 computer, and he was selling them all over the world. And I would log in every day, maybe, not maybe not every day, I didn't want to tie his system up because he had one phone line, that's where it started out, you know, uh, one phone line. 
But I, and you know, I logged in to check and see what was going on. Uh, he jumped into chat a few times. You know, he could hit a key and jump into chat to tell me something that was, I guess, I ought to go to. Uh, Let's see. I guess I need to go to form. Okay, here I think it is. Yeah. Form 80. And, okay, this first time in years I knew. Says he created the BBS software in 1980. Bill Abney of Kansas City, Missouri, uh, running a BBS on a Tandy TRS-80 computer. Uh, anyway, I logged in one day. Anyway, he, he got into chat with me a few times, and he was not friendly. And then I logged in one day, and I was typing a message on the system to somebody and he jumped you're always kind of started to i had people that when i would go into chat you know that's want to help them they were having some kind of trouble or something like that and i would hit the thing and it would pop up say sysstop's going to you know is inviting you to a chat or whatever they would hang up like oh my god i got caught breaking into this guy you know or or uh you know they would they'd hang up so i, I didn't jump into chat very often with somebody Unless they hit the chat and wanted, you know, bing, 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 and then I could come, you know. But he jumped in, and I, it's been, I don't know, 40 years or so. I don't want, and I don't remember exactly what he said, but he used a bunch of bad words at me. And I, I was for many years a boilermaker, a welder. <laughs> I mean, I could. I was used to, I could use some bad words, not that I really did. I think I, in my life, used more than I thought I did, but he jumped in, cussed me out, and said, you know, you know, like, you idiot, what in the hell are you doing, you know? And I said, oh, you know, I'm sorry, what did I do wrong? He said, you're hitting a carriage return at the end of the line, and I just install. I just he had just he was always working on the system, you know. So every time you would go in, there would be some improvements made, and he had just set it up so when you were typing messages, you just kept typing and it wrapped around. You didn't have to hit the enter key or carriage return or whatever it showed on your keyboard. And he said, "You don't hit it if you if you do that again, I'm banning you from my system." And I said, okay. So then after that, when I went in, because I actually, when I was in high school, I was in the dumb class. So I took typing and bookkeeping and that type of stuff. And the other <laughs> the smart smart kids took Latin and algebra, or not algebra, because I actually took algebra. You know, they took trigonometry and calculus and that type of stuff I took. So I actually... And they, I had to take typing, and I was kind of embarrassed because I thought, uh, I'm not sexist, by the way, but I thought at that time that, you know, typing was for women. You know, you could be a teacher, a nurse, I guess, and you could be a office worker that was a woman. So I was kind of embarrassed. I'm glad I took typing. But anyway, I went, after that, when I logged into his system, I was kind of afraid to send a message and then I was also very, when I was typing, because I had to remember not to hit the enter key at the end of the line and uh, whatever. So actually he, he did me a favor because the way he was uh, made me decide, well, I hadn't decided at that point to have a, but when I decided to have a computer bulletin board system, um, I decided not to be like him at all. And so that put me on the path of being really nice to people and helpful and whatever. And I'm glad that, and I have continued that way. Maybe I was always a nice person. I don't know. But 
So he actually did me probably a favor. Um, so anyway, when I purchased the second computer, it, it had, uh, or the second modem, it had uh, AA, I think it was listed in the thing of it. And I didn't know what it was. But, uh, so I had it, and then I actually got in to chat with the guy on Form 80. I, it wasn't an email, it was chat. So I got in to chat with him, and I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. And I said, I've got this, you know, modem, of course, because I was using it, to, you know. And I said, it does AA, what is that? And he says, that's auto answer. And I said, oh, yeah, okay. And uh, I said, uh, what, can, what, what can I do, you know? And he says, I said, what can I do with that? And he says, so you want to have a computer bulletin board system? And I said, uh, well, no, but is that what he says? Yeah, all you could, you know, you could have a computer bulletin board system. And I said, oh, okay. Uh, I said, I guess I'd like to like to try that. And he said, okay, uh, how big of a floppy drive? I don't think hard drives even exist. Um, anyway, how big of a drive do you have? And I said, well, I don't have a, uh, a drive at all. Um, using the tape recorder, and then I have some things called Ectron Stringy. I'm not sure I had the Ectron. I'm just using the tape. Yeah, just I'm, I'm using the tape recorder. And he said, "What?" And I said, hey, "I'm using the tape recorder." And he said, "Oh my God." Uh, he said, "Well, I tell you what you could do." This time he wasn't screaming at me. He seemed pretty nice. Uh, so I guess sometimes he took his medicine or something. <laughs> Um, and he, uh, he said, okay, what you could do is you could peek into memory and then poke in at memory location such and such this number. And I said, what? He said, peek and poke. And I said, I don't know what that is. Well, then I guess his medicine wore off. What? Well, you can't run a computer bulletin board system. You can't do anything. You don't have the hardware to do it, and and you're too dumb on top of that to do it. So give up on that idea. And I said, okay, uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> I don't think I actually said thank you, sir, but I said, okay. Then I sat down with uh, the book that came with your Radio Shack computer, the bait book on basic and flipped through it and then I saw okay if I write a program in basic with this and if I put such and such when the phone rings I knew from the modem that I had that there were certain ports you know so okay well then if I send this it will when the phone rings you know this thing here would change and then I could tell it to take the phone off the hook. And then I could put Howard's Notebook, Welcome to Howard's Notebook. So I did that. This is like a day or two later. So if anybody dialed my number, which nobody would at that time, you know, it would, it would answer and type Welcome to Howard's Notebook. So then the next day I'm flipping page by page through the book on basic. Well, wait a minute. If I send and string, whatever, you know, that would put, you know, enter your name. So I did that. And I just kept piece by piece putting things in. Before long, I had a computer bulletin board system uh, working, and people started calling, people started calling into it. Um... So, at that point then also, what, I, what the reason for Howard's Notebook was, my memory is not very good, and I wanted to have, and that's what I set up, so 
So I set up a list of computer bulletin boards so, so you could log in and there would be a, you could, you know, hit a key and there would be a list of computer bulletin board systems. And then I had a list of ham radio uh, repeaters that were in Kansas City area. Then I had a list of, probably combined with that list, but a list of the times, the day and the time, and the frequency that the ham radio net for the club would be held. And then it was my idea just to have information on there that I could uh, look at. But then, of course, I started adding in a, a message board and all this type of stuff. So uh, with the, the tape recorder, was it, uh, I was using a tape recorder for the... Uh, I'm still trying to get that damn picture back there. Maybe this will work. I was using the tape recorder, you know, to load in the bulletin board system and then to save some information. I really wasn't too good at knowing how to write data at that point. But uh, then eventually I saw that there was the Ektron stringy floppies that you could buy, and I bought four of them and uh, hooked them up. And that was really fun because kind of fast, maybe faster than having a hard drive at that time because the tape was on a loop and then so you could, I could use one for sending data here, one for, you know, the same one for pulling the data and another and that kind of stuff. So working pretty good. Um, so at some point my 1200 baud modems came out and I had several people saying, you know, Jim, you should get a 1200 baud modem. And I mentioned that in this uh, documentary, by the way. That's one of my little clips that uh, I was. T I told people, well, 300 baud is reading speed. You don't. We don't need 1200 baud because I didn't want to spend the money for one. Of course, I ended up getting a 1200 baud, then a 2400 baud, and a six. Oh yeah, I spent oh tons of money on modems. Some place I saw, where did I, bulletin board systems. Here it is. Oh, my God. I had that modem, 300 baud, Hayes modem, all aluminum, all metal. Maybe it wasn't aluminum, but what it was all metal. I wouldn't mind having, if, there again, I don't have the room. I wouldn't mind having one. I should go on eBay and look for one. Oh, I just love that. But, of course, 300 baud was quickly outdated. I wonder if they show... Oh, here we have a, uh, a setup. I wonder what else they're showing here. guess that's it. Images of bulletin board systems. Oh, here's the Model 100 that I had later on, which was Radio Shack's, you know, laptop computer. I owned one of those, too. I owned them all. I also, I owned Commodore 64 computers. Commodore 64 had a uh, SX-64, and it was a portable, and it was, oh my God, maybe that's the reason I have arthritis now, and the screen was color, the screen was about this big, and my eyesight then was okay, oh my God, but anyway, I had one. Um... So, um, I uh, had my computer bulletin board system going. Back then, like I told you, the phone companies were 
I mean, they ripped people off big time. Um, everybody was talking about the fact that if you had a modem, the phone company was going to charge you business rates, and instead of your phone bill being, oh, your phone, our phone bills was, you know, later on with my computer bulletin board system, I, along with three or four other bulletin board systems, uh, we got a connection into a university that was connected to the internet. Not the World Wide Web, it hadn't been invented yet, but they were connected to the internet. And we were allowed to connect into them, and so then we could send internet emails, and I could pull in for my fans of my BBS news groups. And so I pulled an amateur radio news groups that you could then read and post messages on. I pulled in railroading um because I had a friend, uh, Dick Williams, that was interested in railroads. I pulled that in and a few other things for him. I think back then maybe that's when uh, uh, there was a TV show he was interested in. I pulled that in. Anyway, um, so but then, but then after a short period of time, somebody someplace in the world uh, I'm not sure they saw my, you know, domain name, but they saw, well, this is not a military, not, this isn't a domain that ends in dot M-I-L, and this is not one that is a university that ends in, uh, dot E-D-U, and, uh, who in the hell are these people? What are they, uh, you know, are they boilermakers? Are they welders? Are they, uh, butchers? bakers or candlestick makers, they have no business being on the internet. The internet is for, you know, universities and the military and, you know, corporations or something. They have, so we were kicked off. And so then I had to have my, because I wanted to continue it, my computer had to call out of town and there was the Heathkit users group or something in Omaha, Nebraska. And they agreed, they had a connection into the internet, and they agreed that uh, I could send packets of mail out and I could receive the packets of mail in. And so every day, and of course I, you know, overdid it. I mean, I instead of just doing it once a day or something, I had my and a massive, you know, big phone bills or whatever. But... Um, so, um, uh, people were for free, so people used users' names, made up users' names. That was kind of fun when I had that when I was when I wrote my own BBS software. I like I said, I did kick people out or whatever, but I wanted people to use a real name. It didn't really have to be a real name. I just didn't want them using something that was obvious, like not, you know, they could use John Doe or, you know, whatever. But somebody, a kid actually, you know, naturally a kid, uh, logged in with Harry Hacker. So I went into the BBS software and I uh, put in that if you're, you know, if it's Harry Hacker, you can't, you know, it'll pop back, say so you have to use a real name. And so, I, and I, I did the code, you know, in basic, and so proud of myself, because I'm not all that smart, <laughs> but that was fun. And then I looked, you know, at the login thing, and Harry Hacker had logged in. How did he log in? Because <clears throat> I did a, you know, well, anyway, as so I looked, oh, okay, there's a a space before Harry, before the H. Oh, okay, so I went in and, uh, you know, did a search, you know, thing. So, if, okay, if somebody enters their name, it searches to make sure they don't use Harry, you know, Harry, 
hacker and that they can't <clears throat> log in with a name that has a space at the beginning or a space at the end. <clears throat> and a few days later, Harry Hacker. And so I kept, you know, kept working, <clears throat> kept working on that. That was kind of fun, like doing a crossword puzzle or whatever. <clears throat> but anyway, I, I was running my computer bulletin board system, and uh, somebody logs in, and then the guy goes to chat mode, and he said. Uh, what type of computer are you using? I said, it's a Radio Shack Model 1. And he said, uh, let's see, what was it? <clears throat> Do you have a uh, floppy drive or are you using the tape recorder? And I, <clears throat> I said, uh, no, he asked some other question. And I said, no, I'm doing such and such. And he said, oh, okay. And then he said, okay. Uh, oh, and I said, well, you, I wrote, you know, I wrote this BBS program and I, I said, I, I'm sure you never heard of such and such. And he said, yeah, I've heard of such and such. And uh, so I was kind of surprised. And he said, uh, what are you using for uh, your data storage? And I said, well, I'm not using the tape recorder anymore. That was really, he says, yeah, I understand, that sucks. And uh, I said, I'm using something I'm, oh, no, this was it, yeah. I said, I'm using, some, no, this was the thing. I said, I'm using an electron thing you've, I'm sure you never heard of, because <coughs> they didn't sell a lot of them, you know. Because eventually, um, companies did came up, you know, were coming out with hard, floppy drives and hard drives and stuff like that. I said, I'm, I'm sure you never heard of Ektron Stringy Floppy. And he said, yeah, I've heard of them. I said, oh, okay. And he said, so what operating system are you using for it? That kind of surprised me. How would he know that I needed a, you know, an operating system for that? And I said, okay, well, I know you never heard of this. Uh, ESOS, Ektron Stringy Operating System. He says, yeah, I heard of it. And he said, in fact, uh, I wrote it. And I had the, you know, manual... Uh, Laying, you know, printed out manual right there, and I said, uh, no, you didn't. Uh, Tom Wheeler did, and he said, well, I'm using a fake name because I don't want the phone company to charge me, and I said, oh, okay, and he says, uh, do you believe me, and I said, well, you said, you, you said you're Tom Wheeler, so that's okay, you know, and he says, I don't think you believe, and I said, yeah, I, I believe, and he says, uh, type in CMD slash, I don't know, some letter, and I wasn't as worried back then as much as, you know, we later on were worried about, you know, I didn't worry that he was going to race my computer or do something, you know, so I typed it in and then his name, Tom Wheeler, Tom Wheeler, scrolled and scrolling on the screen. I said, okay, yeah. So then he said, uh, so you wrote your the BBS program there in BASIC? And I said, yeah. I said, I had to flip through the manual you know, and kept saying, I'd say, what can I do with this command, you know? And he said, uh, he said I'm, I have a degree in electrical engineering from KU, uh, Kansas University. And he said, uh, I don't know anything about, you know, computer bulletin board systems. And he said, I'd like to come over and see your system. And I said, sure. I said, there's, you know, it's, it's very basic. I mean, it's nothing fancy. It's just, you know, TRS-80 computer, the Ektron stringy floppies the modem, that's it. I said, you're welcome to come on over. So he came on over and he, I showed him everything and he said, could I have a copy of the, your program? And I said, sure. So I think I printed it out. It was also, and I think I, you know, gave it to him. And then a few days later, he logged in and he said, hey, Jim, I wrote a BBS program for you, you know, using your, looking at what you had done. And I, and he said, I'd like to bring it over to you. And I said, fantastic. So he came over. Well, I never wrote, <laughs> I mean, it was great. I mean, it was just a starting one, but it was great. And uh, I, I thought, wow, I'm never going to try to, you know, 
write any code or do anything else. I'll just pay somebody, although he gave it to me, you know. I said, I'll just, uh, later on I paid him for, uh, this, he converted his program then to, for the Commodore 64 or something. But, so, uh, Tom Wheeler, by the way, was also an amateur radio operator. He's still active, and if you, uh, I forget his call sign, if you're into amateur radio and you're into uh, DMR radio, digital radio, um, he, uh, he, uh, his program is used for uh, digital ham radio for ha for amateur radio operators to enter in uh, data. You put it in there and then you load it into your, your phone or your ham radio. I haven't talked to him in 30 years or so or whatever. But... Uh, Anyway, so then I had a really good, you know, working uh, bulletin board system. But Tom is very smart. Well, maybe with the years he's got dumber, I don't know. But he was very smart. But he was one of those people who knew he was smart and... At a disadvantage, I've worked with people like that that were really smart, but they won't listen to you and that, because they think they know. And if you offer a suggestion or if you, you know, because anyway, uh, he incorporated my thing in there of scanning to make sure Harry Hacker and other things like that he used. But, of course, he changed it and made it into a, I don't know, a nested array with, you know, and a stored in memory, and I, he did all kinds of, but anyway, he, he did it well. Uh, to show you how people like that are, and I'm not saying anything bad about Tom, just, this is a little educational in case you're one of these people, don't be that way. Um, a guy contacted me, and, uh, said, I can't log in to your BBS uh, with with my name. I have to use such and such a name. And I can't use my real name. And I know you like people to use their real name, so I can't do it. And I said, well, you should be able to. What, what you know, what's your name? And he said, John Hancock. And I said, I, I'm sure you should be able to log in. I said, just a second. And I tried to log in, and it rejected, you know, rejected it. And I'm like, uh, I don't understand. And then, I w oh, wait a minute, because Tom had added searching for bad words in the thing. Not just certain bad words that were a thing, but other bad, you know, bad words. I uh, okay, I think I see the problem. Hancock, cock. So I contacted... Uh, you know, Dick, and I said, hey, you, you need to modify your, no, no, I don't, it's perfect. I said, no, there's a problem, this guy, no, he can log in. I said, I tried logging in with it, you can't. He said, yes, you can. I said, no, you know, and I said, well, try it, you know, and then, whoop, I can't get in. He says, I see what the problem is, he says, you know, it searched for the word cock and it turned up inside him. He said, I'll change the, uh, I'll change the thing. I said, okay, and great, and then he changed it, and I, you know, put the, you know, upgraded the software, and then, I don't know, weeks later or whatever, nobody else could log in. I mean, you, you could log in if you were, but if you tried to come in as somebody new, it wouldn't let you. And so I'm, I'm thinking, oh, God, I got to I gotta call Tom because I don't understand it. But then I looked at his code, and I keep looking, and then I see something about an array, you know, name, such and such, an array or whatever, and then like 250 or something in brackets up there, you know. And wait a minute, how many users do I have? 250, maybe it was 500, I don't remember. 
250. Okay. So then I contact him, and he says, no, 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 no. And I said, well, on, on your software, on line such and such and such and such, there's a ray, and there's 250, and I've got 250 people. And he said, oh, okay. I'll change that to 500 or 1,000 or something. I'll take care of it. So he took care of that. So those were the good old days. Um, so after the Radio Shack Model 1, I ran the BBS on a Tandy uh, 1000. Then I used Commodore 64 for years. Um, all types of things. And over the years, um, I wanted to, oh, software, a list of BBS software. Okay, here it is. <coughs> I ran a lot of BBS, people, that's one of the complaint people had and still have about me, if you want. Well, maybe not so much now because you're not going to my blog. But the fact that I was always changing and playing with things, trying new things. Um, so I would get the system, I would get my, well, one thing two people complain about. I, uh, I had my system set up so that after three months, if you did not log in within three months time, I had software that automatically ran and deleted you from the members list. And there was an awful lot of people, it seems like, that would log in after, you know, 93 days or something, you know, right, ap <coughs> right after the three-month period. And they, well, how come every time I call here, I have to sign up like I'm a new person, you know? I just say, well, you know, you didn't, I automatically erase it after, or erase, you know, remove people that don't call. And so I never had more than like 500 people. Um, I went to this BBS. This was the second one, I believe. BBS Con, one BBS Con in Colorado Springs. A doctor and I went there. He had been bugging me for years that he wanted to invest in my computer bulletin board system. And I said, I don't charge. He said, it'd be a fantastic business. No, no. And he finally, you know, finally this thing came up, BBS, you know, thing. And I said, I'm going there. I said, if you want to go in, you know. So he went with me, and he wanted to invest in my, in my bulletin board system, but I didn't charge or anything. And uh, so we went out there. And I don't believe it was the first one. I think it was the second one. That might have been the first one. I don't think so. Anyway, went out there. There must have been 500, maybe more, sys stops there. And so we were on the, to start the event off, they had things going, you know. But for the first time, you know, the, everybody assembled in the auditorium. And we're all sitting there. And... Uh, up on the stage is Ward Christensen, who, uh, and another guy who invented the bulletin board system, you know. They're up on the stage. But, and then I think it was him that got up and said, what I want you to do is everybody who has a computer bulletin board system, stand up. So I stood up. Almost everybody else stood up. The doctor with me, he stayed seated, and there was a few other people seated. But I stood up, and he said, okay. If you've had a computer bulletin board system for uh, less than a year, sit down. And about a third of the people sat down. And then he just kept, he just kept doing that. Uh, if, uh, if you've had one less than uh, five years, sit down. And they're, whatever, I forget what the number, you know, I'm standing. And there's, I'm standing, I was in, way in the front, sort of the front. And I looked around, there was, there was maybe, I don't know, 25 people or something standing up. And then he says something more, you know, and some more people sat down. And it was like, 
Of course, the people on the stage up there, those two guys were the first people to do it in Chicago, you know. And then there's, I don't know, a dozen or so of us. And then he said, anybody who has one. And so then, you know, I sat down. And uh, then he says, okay, everybody, all the sysops, stand up. Okay, if you have less than uh, 50 subscribers, maybe it was 100. If you have less than 100 subscribers, you know, sit down. Almost nobody sat down. Okay, if you have less than 500, uh, you know, less than 500 subscribers, sit down. I sat down. Everybody else was standing up. Because what, and then it, he just kept going on, and, it, the, you know, what all these people were doing, which is fine, is once you, <laughs> once you logged into their system, you were there forever. You know, you were a user. Even though they maybe deleted you from their thing, they must have, they probably had a, a, a data place, you know, or a printout or something. So I sat down immediately. Um, but what I did over the years is I love trying different BBS software or whatever. And uh, I never ran an Apple computer or a Macintosh or an Atari. Commodore computer I did. I do not see. Here's Commodore's BBS software. I do not see. The BBS, you know, my software should have been on there. Uh, actually not. I mean, I just wrote it for my. But uh, Tom Wheeler's software should have been on there, but it's not on there either. Just not enough people because it was made available to other people. He also wrote a terminal program, a really excellent one. There again, I he made an excellent terminal program that you used. Be like, this is before... The World Wide Web, so think of a sort of as a, a browser, but you could log into chat groups and all kinds of things on, you know, the uh, internet, not the World Wide Web. But I told him, you know, hey, your, you know, your terminal program is fantastic. But then I told him when I saw some things coming up, okay, you need to update it. Just put this little thing in there. Do this or do that. Nope, it's perfect the way it is. And so people stopped using it eventually. Uh, so I never ran any Commodore computer software other than my... Now, um, Microsoft, okay. I do not remember. Let's see. MS-DOS. Okay. Major BBS, I did not run that. I remember that. I'd never run it because they charged a lot of money for it. And it was, let's see. PC board I ran for a short period of time. Pro board uh, BBS, I ran that. Quick BBS, I ran that. And I'm going to jump down here. Okay, remote access, I ran that. Both of those were great. Like Quick BBS was a fantastic BBS program. I think the kid who wrote it was like maybe 14 years old. Great program. I ran it for quite a while. Loved it. But then I think he, when he turned 16, or when his testicles dropped, <laughs> and he got interested in girls and cars. I'm sure he probably got interested maybe in girls, and then he was old enough to drive a car, he lost interest in it. Maybe he sold it, but he lost interest in it. Uh, RBBS, uh, and like I said, remote access, I ran that. That was another situation. A, a kid about, I don't know, 15 or 14 or whatever. And I, I just knew then, God, don't let his testicles drop. Because then as soon as he got interested in girls, he was no longer interested in... Uh, so now TBBS was professional software. That was done by P 
people, and they sold it for a good chunk of money, and I ran it. And then uh, some doctors at KU Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri, a couple of doctors wanted to start, this is before the World Wide Web, keep in mind, they wanted to start a computer bulletin board system for the hospital. So they contacted me and asked me some questions, and I told them how to do it and what I thought they should have, you know, log in and uh, what the, you know. And then they came out to where I lived. They saw my BBS running. And then they went back to the hospital and asked if they could buy my TBBS software. I gave them a price for it, you know. And then they came out, brought a check out, and set it up at uh, KU Medical Center. And then, of course, eventually that... Uh, became, when the World Wide Web was invented, became, you know, a website or whatever. Uh, oh, and here, oh my God. This is the last one that I ran, Wildcat BBS. I love that software. Uh, I sort of wish I could run it today. Actually, I do know, yeah, I could run it using Telnet or, you know, no, 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 okay. Um... Uh, OS2, I ran OS2. Um, I don't think I ran. OS2 was a great operating system. That was fantastic. That was like MS DOS or what, you know, Linux or whatever. OS2, great operating system. And here is a Tandy TR. There's a Form 80. And TBBS, I'm not sure, I mentioned I ran TBBS. Uh, Tandy. I'm not sure what I was running TBBS on, but I ran it, that's what I sold to uh, the doctors. How long has this video been going must be a long time because I need a drink of coke I should drink orange juice instead it's 2.18 in the morning um, well let me quickly uh, eventually the um, what was the magazine called? A magazine actually came out for system operators that had computer bulletin board systems, and for I don't know how many issues, it was great. Oh, I loved. It. I read it. Started the front cover. I read every advertisement. I read everything in it. It was about computer bulletin board systems. And it was the reason that the uh, this was set up. You know, these things were for, uh, and Sysops went went there for that. And then, what was the magazine called? Anyway, the person who edited the magazine and published the magazine uh, decided pretty quickly that computer bulletin board systems should make money. Up until this point, all of us were just, you know, some people did charge a little bit of money for a membership so they could, you know, buy a CD drive to put porn on, and some of them had four or five, you know, CD drives going in their computers so people could pay, I don't know, 15 bucks a year and they could get a, a porn file or something. If people had games, some people had games and they charged a very small amount of money. Uh, but then this guy that had the magazine or whatever, like I said, I, um, I never charged and, uh, and I thought it should be totally free and a lot of others did also, but every issue then of this magazine became 
how to make money with your computer bulletin board system, the software you need to buy to make money with it, the hardware you need. Everything was, you know, which bulletin board systems are making money, blah, 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 blah. And then a whole bunch of places it was, you know, they were charging. And that was, that was, there were still tons of bulletin board systems, but that was, that really hurt them. And then, of course, in 1995, when the World Wide Web was invented, that was it. I'm sure you'll still find someplace, especially maybe in some place like, you know, Russia or someplace, you'll still find computer bulletin board systems running, but not not like the old days or whatever. I didn't mention the, the uh, FidoNet where all these, all our computer bulletin board systems were connected together, we were networked, and we could send packets of information to each other before the internet, by the way. Uh, not before the internet, but before the World Wide Web. All time. I didn't mention that. Maybe sometimes I'll come back and, uh, you know, talk about that and talk about a few other things. But, um... Oh, I did want to mention because when I, I mentioned when I started out that I listed other computer bulletin board systems. So in the beginning, there was like four or five of us. But kids would set up computer bulletin board systems. Um, my kids, you know, I was divorced at about that time. And I made sure my kids had access to a computer at their mother's. And they set up computer bulletin board systems, and their friends set up computer, but not just them. I mean, it was like uh, the I knew several police officers that set up uh, computer bulletin board systems. One uh, Graham set one up, and I forget what it was called, law enforcement or something or other in Kansas City, Missouri. The Internal Revenue or the Internal Internal Affairs did not like that, and so they investigated him. So he had, uh, you know, the only computer bulletin board investigated by Internal Revenue or Internals, you know, whatever he. Uh, um, and then there was later on. Uh, other police officers, but like when I was living then out in Belton, I had a small town, had my bulletin board system was operating out there. A police sergeant in Belton had a computer bulletin board system going. A dispatcher had a bulletin board system going. And so it got to be quite, uh, you know, quite a thing. And then, of course, the charging of trying to make money with it, but then the World Wide Web. Uh put an end to that. But I moved Howard's Notebook to the World Wide Web. And it's, here we are. You're still, you know. So you're watching and logged into and whatever, one of the oldest systems around online systems. But there's a lot more about the, oh, I think I mentioned that I am the star. I spent about 30 seconds <laughs> on here. Uh, I was in Florida when uh, this documentary came out, and Jason announced it. By the way, I should put his email, and you should send him, you should send him an email, and... Uh, if I remember, I'll put his email, send him an email and say, Hey, Jim Howard has a video and he says that you didn't release his three-hour tape and, and, or video and he wants to post it on, on the YouTube. He'd have a three-hour video. Please release it. Anyway, uh, the documentary was being released in California at the Computer Museum in 
Oh, I forget. Okay, computer museum. And I went out there. Okay. Computer museum, probably a bunch of them. Uh, not Mountain View. Oh, come on, I know. Computer, Mountain View. I don't think that was Mountain View. Anyway, he had the... Uh, that kind of looks like it. Okay, crap. Um, so he was having the, uh, not preview, what do you call it? When the new movie comes out or whatever and they have the event. So I traveled from Florida out there and my daughter and son-in-law were living and working in California at that time. And I flew into, uh, Ho say San Jose, I think it was. Eh, anyway, uh, I flew into San Francisco, and uh, they lived and worked in Los Angeles. So they drove up and picked me up. And so we went there for the coming out of BBS, the documentary. And uh, so when I go in, he says, oh, you know, Jim, glad you're here. And he said, I think you've came the longest distance. You came from Florida, you know, to, and I uh, you came the longest distance. And he says, uh, I want to tell you something here. He says, I, I hope you won't get upset. He says, in the d documentary, he says, I can still change it. At that point, he hasn't, you know, burned them to DVDs. This was showing it. Then if everything was okay, then they got burned to the three DVDs. He says, so I can change it. And he said, but uh, you get the biggest laugh. I think I actually got the only laugh. <laughs> you get the biggest laugh in this. And he said... Uh, he said, I can, t I can take that out. And I said, and of course, I didn't even know what it was, you know, because I talked for three hours, and I had no idea what was even in there, you know. I knew I wasn't in there very much, but that I wouldn't be. But uh, he says, I can take it. I said, no, that's fine. Leave it in. And uh, so in the, I think this is, we can stop this, I think, because I think, I don't think I've ever watched the thing that far. Um, not that I just looked for myself, you understand. Um, so in the, uh, I'm going to spoil it, the big laugh is going to be, you won't get a big laugh. I'd probably not get any laugh. Uh, when he finally started asking me questions, when it came to, Carrollton, Texas, he said uh, something like, you know, what's the the best thing that you got out of some, I forget what the question was, and I said, well, I got laid a few times. That's what got the biggest laugh because one, you know, you see me and he asked this question to a couple other people and I don't know what, you know, what they said. Uh, Oh, made some great friends or something like that, or learned to program or something. Then it comes to me, and uh, that got a big laugh. So, so I am the comedian of the documentary, BBS the documentary. Okay, I got to end this and get something to drink. Actually, get something. To, although I just. 
I just had something to eat just before this started. I had three, what are they called? Mexican little round long things with beef inside. And then I had some olives. And then I had one hot pickle. And these are hot pickles. So I didn't dare. I was looking. That's the only thing on the plate. And I was looking at it. But thought, no, no, I better not. Not while I'm making the video. Okay, that is it. Uh, I want to say something, by the way. I think you all know this. When I or another or any YouTuber upload a video to uh, to YouTube, it takes it a while. If you go immediately, as soon as you get, well, I want you to go immediately, as soon as you get a notice that uh, it's been uploaded, it's going to be at 360p or something. It takes a little while for the... Um, I didn't read this, but a toddler locked up his dad's iPad until 2067. I'm guessing with the iPad or Apple or something, maybe, I guess you can, for some reason, say, I want to lock this until a certain date, you know, like next week because I'm going to be out of town or whatever, and I guess some toddler must have punched in something, and now the dad's uh, iPad is locked up to 2067. So, anyway, what was I saying? Oh, when we upload a YouTube, it takes a while before it gets to 1080p or 4K mode or whatever, because it has to. Because I've, sometimes I upload them uh, in a format that is very quickly done. And then sometimes I uh, upload in a different format. And uh, I did read this item up here, man. I don't, I mean, I better not. It might be flagged as inappropriate for uh, something if. Uh, Anyway, I thank you very much for watching. Uh, I guess do a thumbs up. Also, oh, also I wanted to mention that when I upload, I try to get the tags in and I try to get the links underneath it. Sometimes, like now, I want to get something to eat, maybe even take a nap. It's 2.30 a.m. So the links underneath this may not be updated immediately. Sometimes I even come in the next day and add one that I forgot to add or something like that, just so you know. So leave a thumbs up. Uh, try to use the links below if you can. Uh, this month I think I'm going to get, I think it's five, well I won't get it because they don't give it to, <laughs> uh, for the last month I owned, I owned, I earned from Amazon affiliate program uh, I think five or ten dollars. No, not ten. Less than ten dollars, or they would pay it. So it's less. I think it's five dollars. But if you people use the link below, you know, go to use the link, go to Amazon. You don't have to buy what the link is to. As long as you're there, if you go and buy a big screen TV or a computer system or whatever, I am supposed to get a a uh, small commission, and it doesn't cost you anything. So. Try to bookmark that. Try to remember that to do that. It'd be kind of nice. I mean, I make, well, I don't make any money because I spend more. I, I take in about, I think, $40 a month or less from YouTube for these YouTube videos. So it'd be nice if you'd use the affiliate link and, you know, that would help out. That should probably, if you were doing that, some of you were doing it, it'd be more than I take in from YouTube. Also, if you haven't subscribed, I have been right below 3,000 subscribers forever. It'd be nice to get up to 3,000 subscribers. Of course, once I get up above, once I get to 3,000, then I'm going to want to get to 5,000. 
but I've been on YouTube since 2005, and I'm not to 3,000 yet, and I'm 78 years old. I don't think I'm going to uh, be around long enough to see 5,000 subscribers or 10,000 subscribers or whatever. Anyway, thank you very much for watching.